Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, thanks very much for being with us. You're welcome. Uh, UK Prime Minister David Cameron himself has been on a whistle-stop tour of Europe. Here you are in Brussels. What brings you here? What do you hope to achieve? Well, I was making a speech this morning at the European Policy Centre and in that speech I was setting out what I consider to be the positive and overwhelming case for the UK and as part of that Scotland to remain a member of the European Union. And I want very much in the period running up to the UK's in-out referendum for people outside of the UK to hear that there are voices in favour of the UK staying in Europe. Not because it's perfect, I was also setting out some areas of reform that I think uh, would be sensible, but Scotland and the UK's economic interests, I think our social and cultural interests, lead me to the conclusion that we are far better off being members of the European Union and arguing for that reform from within. What specifically do you want to reform? Because there's a lot of slogans you hear, mm. big on the big things, small on the small things that the EU shouldn't interfere in every part of people's lives. What specifically would you like to change about the EU? Well, firstly, let me make this point clear, and it's a point of distinction between myself and David Cameron. I don't think we need treaty change to deliver reforms. Um, I think it can be done within the existing treaty framework. I, I put forward a couple of examples today. So, you know, to be specific about what I mean when I say that e the EU shouldn't interfere in matters that are best left to the discretion and judgment of national governments, I've cited public health policy. Uh, clearly, I can't go into this in detail because it's before the European Court of Justice just now, but the Scottish Government has been challenged on our proposals to tackle alcohol misuse. I, I think how national governments respond to public health challenges should be the discretion of, of national governments. I also think there is a need, and indeed the new commission has taken this forward through the Better Regulation uh, Work Programme, to reduce the burden of regulation, to make it more proportionate, to put the principles of subsidiarity and mm. proportionality into practice so that they become you know, reality, not just uh, slogans. I think there is a case on an ongoing basis to look at how we further democratise the European Union, give the Parliament more of a voice, even more of a voice than it has just now. Any institution, any Parliament, if it wants to be in touch with the people it serves, should constantly, constantly be looking at how it does things better and how it reforms. So these are just some of the things that I would argue for. Um, I think on many of these things, it should be possible to get agreement and a consensus, but overwhelmingly, for hard economic reasons, as well as all of the other reasons, I think we should argue that case from within. What can you realistically expect to achieve when EU relations remain a competence for Westminster? Well, it's no secret that I would love that to be different. I wanted Scotland to vote yes to independence last year, but we, we didn't do that. And therefore, what I'm seeking to achieve is a louder voice for Scotland at Westminster, but also in the European Union. So the proposals for further devolution that will shortly be considered by the Westminster Parliament touch on areas of Scottish government influence and role within European decision making and more particularly within the formulation of UK decision making that then feeds into European decision making. I think we should have a much stronger and more formal role in the development of the UK position on matters before uh, European Union. I think uh, where a UK minister is not able to lead a council meeting, a Scottish government minister, if we have devolved responsibility in the area, should lead. We've had circumstances in the past where Scottish government ministers on fishing, for example, have had to sit quietly while a civil servant leads discussions at a council meeting. That's wrong. So there are ways in which... But eventually, I mean, move. the UK is the member of the EU, it's not Scotland. I, I accept that. You know, it's not the position I wanted to be the case, but I accept that's the mm. position we're in. But, you know, the whole point of devolution is to give uh, Scotland and other devolved nations within the UK a louder voice and more influence and I want to see Scotland take that opportunity um, both at a UK level and within the European Union. I have to say the people I speak to when I come to Brussels are very open to hearing more of the Scottish voice. So i just go um, specifically into what David Cameron's looking for. Um, it's often said that he's not laid out what he wants, but in fact he has in a number of speeches over the past few years. Um, do you think EU migrants should be able to claim in-work benefits if they've been living in the UK for less than four years? Well, I think there is a case, and I said this today, uh, for looking at how we change the rules and regulations around benefit entitlement to further crack down on abuse. But I think when you try to go beyond that to fundamentally undermine the freedom of movement, then that takes you into... So you would oppose uh, that? Territory. I, I'm yet to be convinced of, of that. There are already 
uh, rules in place in terms of uh, habitual residence, right to reside test, you know, periods for entitlement. Um, so yes, I think there are ways in which we should uh, look at how we tighten those rules to crack down on abuse. And I guess there would be a lot of support for that in other countries. But freedom of movement surely is a fundamental principle of the European Union. And we benefit from it because mm. many people from Scotland, other parts of the UK, go to other European countries to live and to work. Do you think we should strip out of reference to ever closer union in the EU treaties? Um, I, I think that is focusing on something that is, you know, rhetoric rather than... It's what Mr Cameron wants. Well, I don't have to agree with everything Mr Cameron wants, and I think he's yet to set out why that is so fundamentally important. You know, the UK is not in the euro. I support the fact it's not in the euro. I wouldn't support an independent Scotland going into the euro so in a sense you know we have the the practical manifestation of not you know going down every road to ever closer union that might have been envisaged when those words were written why you know you need a treaty change to uh, underline that is less obvious and i think the danger david cameron is getting himself into is he's putting up these big you know issues of principle that probably he can't deliver that then makes it much harder for him to argue the positive case for eu membership should non-Eurozone countries have a say in decisions affecting only the Eurozone? I think there is uh, not just a case for it, I think there is inevitably going to be a direction of travel towards greater governance of the Eurozone by Eurozone countries. I think that, and to some extent, that is one of the logical conclusions of much of the UK's position. What the UK sometimes appears to present as if it wants though is to have its cake and eat it. It doesn't want to be in the Eurozone uh, but it wants to continue to have influence in the decisions that govern it. And these are, you know, these are complex discussions and countries will have to judge and assess and reassess their national interests in all of these discussions. But, uh, you know, I, I think one of the problems, and you said people know what David Cameron wants, um, in maybe very, very broad terms that's true, but there is a lack of detail and definition around that that I don't think is helping the debate right now. Should we stop migrants claiming child benefits for dependents living outside the well, UK? Again, I mean, that's one of the examples of where there may well be an, and is a case to look at sensible changes uh, that are about cracking down on abuse. These are, uh, you know, issues where I think there is a case for, for discussing making changes. Uh, but I guess my almost philosophical difference of opinion with David Cameron here is I think it's better to approach these issues and try to get consensus uh, from a position of collaboration rather than doing what the UK government is appearing to do just now, which is stamp its feet and, you know, mm -hmm. sort of threaten to throw all of its toys out of the pram if it doesn't get its own way. Could you explain this double majority which you're proposing? It's quite the simple. EU the UK is not a unitary state. It's a multinational state. And during the debate on Scottish independence, we were told that each nation of the UK had an equal voice and mm -hmm. would be listened to. Now, if that's true, and I hope that those saying that did mean that, then it surely would be wrong for Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland to be taken out of Europe, even if we vote to stay in, just because England has got the much bigger population and can effectively outvote us. So a double majority arrangement. Is it democratic? Uh, well, let me finish explaining what it is and then I'll explain why absolutely it's democratic. Would the double majority, and th these kind of arrangements are commonplace in federal systems, uh, would mean that the UK could only come out if England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland voted to come out of each of the component parts of the UK. Now, that's more democratic than one country being taken out against its will. But it's a referendum on British membership of the EU, not the individual country. But Britain is not a unitary state, or the United Kingdom, to be precise about the, the member state, is not a unitary state. And, you know, anybody who wants to argue that it is right that Scotland, even if we voted to stay in, or indeed Wales or Northern Ireland, should, regardless of that, end up outside of the European Union, given all the consequences that would have for jobs and investment and our society, our very sense of who we are, um, I think is, are, are the ones arguing uh, an undemocratic case. But you would essentially be vetoing, say, the rest of the, of the, of the countries voted uh, you to know, leave. I, I put forward a case last year in the Scottish independence referendum that Scotland should be a member state of the European Union in its own right. That's not what is happening. We've got to recognise the nature of the United Kingdom. It's not a unitary state. It's a multinational state. And you know, if you want to be a multinational state that genuinely allows the voice of all of the nations within it to be heard, then you have to accept sometimes that, you know, these compromises have to be made. It would be fundamentally undemocratic for Scotland to find itself 
at the exit door of the European Union if we had, in a referendum, voted to stay in the European Union. If David Cameron comes back with a bad deal from Brussels in terms of the renegotiation he's trying to pull off, would that trigger a second referendum for you? No, I, I, I will argue in the EU referendum that the UK should stay in because I think it's overwhelmingly in our interest. I've set out as a statement of fact that if after that referendum Scotland finds itself outside because the UK has voted that way, even though we voted to stay in, I think there would be a lot of people who would say, hold on, we don't want to be out of the European Union, we want to look again at whether we should be an independent member of the European Union. But in a sense, I'm, I'm giving David Cameron the solution to that as well. If he agrees to the double majority arrangement, that scenario can't arise. Would that sound a bit like holding him to ransom, perhaps? Um, not if I'm offering the solution. You know, I'm, I'm saying here's a sensible solution that means this scenario can't arise. And if I'm taking away or offering a mechanism that can take away any possibility of that scenario arising, I don't think it can fairly be described as holding somebody to ransom. Would you rule out uh, a referendum over the life of this parliament? Uh, on Scottish independence, that's not for me to rule out. Uh, the best I can do is propose one. And I said during the, the general election campaign that you know, circumstances have to change from the referendum last year. And then people have to vote for that in a, an election. Fundamentally and ultimately, it's not up to me whether there's another Scottish independence referendum. It's up to the majority of people in Scotland. Would that be perhaps a majority in the Scottish Parliament in the elections next year? Another SNP well, majority. I'll come back and talk to you again when we publish our 2016 manifesto. I'm not going to write that today. Um, but the key, you know, we talked about a, a, a double majority, uh, talk about a double lock on an independence referendum. Firstly, a party has to propose it in a manifesto. Um, whether that's the SNP or another party, presumably it would be the SNP. But then people have to vote for that manifesto and they have to vote for it in sufficient numbers to give that party a majority in the Scottish Parliament. And then there's a third bit of the lock. If there is another referendum, people have to vote to be independent. I can't impose a referendum or independence on the Scottish people. It will always be driven by the democratic wishes of the Scottish people. And talking of double majority locks, would English voters have a say on a Scottish independence referendum? Uh, no, I mean, you know, people say, does, does my double majority proposal mean that English people should have a say? You know, if Scotland is looking at the question of whether to be independent, people in Scotland should decide. If the UK is looking to be independent, if you want to use that analogy from Europe, people in the UK should decide. All I'm saying is internally within the UK, how those votes should be determined. I mean, I suppose the analogy of giving England uh, the vote on whether Scotland should be independent or not in a European uh, referendum would be saying France or Germany got to vote on whether the UK left the European Union. Clearly that would not be uh, the, the acceptable position.